This piece of land is talked about all the time. After watching this video, you will know all the important information about the origins of the conflict and about how it is connected to the story of the entire world. So this is what is called Palestine or the land of Israel. Both Jews and Arabs claim that this piece of land is rightfully theirs. But who rightfully owns it, really? First, let's meet our heroes. On one hand, we have the Jews, and on the other hand, the Arabs. Now to the first question of the day, when exactly do we begin our story? So we will start about 150 years ago. Palestine, and pretty much the entirety of the Arab world, was under Ottoman control. The Ottomans, by then, were an empire in decline. What is called the land of Palestine has actually been populated mostly by Muslim Arabs ever since the Islamic conquests that followed the founding of Islam in the 7th century. But do note, the Arabs and the Ottomans are not the same. Even though both are Muslim, the Ottomans are Turks, while the Arabs are, well, Arabs. And the Arabs have decided that they have had just about enough of Ottoman oppression. They have started to dream about removing their oppressors and setting up a large Arab country across large sections of the Middle East. But their time has not come yet. So that's where our Arab heroes were at. What about our other heroes, the Jews? Well, they are actually scattered all across Europe, America, and the Muslim world. How did they come to be scattered this way? Well, the Jews are called Jews because they come from Judea. Judea was actually the old name for what is called Palestine. The place was home to the Kingdom of Judea and the Kingdom of Israel, and it's the main place where the biblical stories take place. Even much later than that, another important figure was to emerge there, Jesus of Nazareth. But that's another story. So to make a really long story really short, the Jews were scattered from this land mostly by several unsuccessful wars against the Roman Empire about 2000 years ago. After the last unsuccessful war against the Romans, the emperor, Hadrian, actually changed the name of the province from Judea to Palestine, probably to spite the Jews and to finally sever their connection to that piece of land. Ever since these events, the Jews have spread all over the world and have been routinely expelled and persecuted by various countries. And now that we understand the origin of the Jewish situation, we can go back to about 150 years ago. A curious idea started circulating among the Jews of Europe during that time. The idea goes pretty much like this. We have been persecuted for almost 2000 years, and Europe is just seeing the birth of modern nation-states, which we seem to be excluded from. Why don't we start a nation-state of our own, and where better to do it than in the land to which we are indigenous? Palestine. This idea of having Jews move to start a state in their ancestral homeland of Palestine or the land of Israel is called Zionism. You might have come across this term. So this idea was not widely accepted among Jews. Some Jews had pretty good lives in Europe, but some Jews had really bad lives. For example, the Jews of the Russian Empire, who routinely suffered pogroms and persecution. So, of course, if you'd probably die staying in Russia, you might as well try your luck with this Zionism thing, right? So many Russian Jews started immigrating into Ottoman Palestine and have even attempted to revive Hebrew, which was the ancient language spoken by the ancient Israelites and in which the Bible is written. The language has been successfully revived and is spoken today in Israel. Palestine has already had a Jewish population, but it was, of course, primarily populated by Muslim Arabs. So one could say that this is where our two heroes meet for the first time. The Arabs and the Zionist Jews come into contact as soon as the immigration starts. While the Jews have brought substantial economic development to the areas to which they came, the Arabs were somewhat suspicious. Remember, the Arabs were starting to dream of shaking off Ottoman rule and establishing a pan-Arabic state. But the Jews' talk of returning to Zion could prove problematic. And to make the friction even worse, the Jews were buying land from the Arab landowners. This dispossessed the Arab peasants and led the Arabs to fear a Jewish takeover. The Arab landowners were complaining about the land sales by day, but selling land for their own personal profit by night. Meanwhile, World War I has broken out in Europe, so it's time for a world war. The war was fought mainly between Britain, France and Russia on one side and Austro-Hungary, Germany and the Ottoman Empire on the other. 
The Arabs didn't care so much about the war. They were hostile towards the Ottomans, so they served as natural allies to the British and the French. The Jews, on the other hand, hated both the Russians and the Ottomans, who have been starting to repress them in Palestine. The British were starting to realize that the Western Front was stuck in the trenches, so they decided that the best way to make progress in the war was to go through the Central Powers' back door, through the Ottoman Empire. They made a secret arrangement with key figures in the Arab world, promising to support a pan-Arabic state, if the Arabs were to rise up and help defeat the Ottomans. Spoiler alert, the Arabs were not exactly going to get that state. Meanwhile, Palestine was seen as especially useful, due to its proximity to the Suez Canal. But the British needed some way to justify taking over it, especially when the US has yet to fully enter the war and Russia was in the middle of a communist revolution. So what did the British do? Meet the Balfour Declaration, a declaration made by Great Britain according to which they aim to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine. Or in other words, the British declared that they would back the Zionist cause. Truth be told, the French were doing the same thing at the time, but they were not as loud about it. So the Zionist Jews have rejoiced. Finally, they have gotten a major power to back them up. But the Arabs were, well, confused. On one hand, they were supposed to be friendly towards the British due to their promise of a pan-Arab state. But on the other hand, they were also angry about the Balfour Declaration. So as we all know, the British and the French won the war, and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. The French and the British then proceeded to carve out the middle East by drawing lines on maps. What ended up happening was that the French received what is today Syria and Lebanon and the British received the land of Palestine, known by Jews as the land of Israel, and Jordan. They also had influence over Iraq, Egypt, and the Arab Peninsula. After the war, the nations decided that they don't want to go to war again, so they established the League of Nations, which was like the UN, but before there was a UN. The League of Nations gave the British a mandate over Palestine, meaning that the British were to rule over it until the local population could be able to stand on its own. The purpose of the mandate was both to provide the Arab population with independence and provide the Jews with a national home. At that point, the Arabs still vastly outnumbered the Jews in Palestine, as most Jews in the world were still reluctant to leave their homes. It was during this time that what is called Palestine came to be more exactly defined and came to the borders of what they are today, as it used to also include parts of what is Jordan today. Anyway, the Jews and the Arabs under the mandate didn't exactly get along. More and more Jews kept immigrating into Palestine and they bought more and more lands from the Arabs who were growing more and more concerned and aggressive. Arab raids against Jewish settlements became frequent. The Jews were realizing that the Arabs are in danger and gradually stopped employing them to work the fields. This, in turn, made the Arabs even more poor and more frustrated and the raids were becoming more common. The Jews also had some military organizations that were slowly building up. These organizations all shared the same goal of establishing a Jewish state, but they also didn't exactly get along with some of the organizations trying to appease the Arabs and the British, and some of the organizations being more hostile towards them. Anyway, the Middle East was also becoming a pretty important piece of the British Empire, as it was a major source of oil and also home to the Suez Canal, which was what connected the British to their precious holdings in India. So they really didn't want all this drama going on in Palestine. In addition to that, they also had to worry about tensions rising between them and their rivals, that is, Italy, Japan, and also the new aggressive government in Germany, led by a guy named Hitler. You might have heard of him, and you know what that means. It's almost time for a world war. So the British forces were not really focused on Palestine, they had other, more important things to worry about. The Arabs, feeling that their way of life is under threat and that their land is taken away from them, and seeing that the Jewish immigration into Palestine was only intensifying, finally erupted into a revolt. The British forces were not prepared for such an uprising, which damaged the Jewish settlements. The revolt also marks the first time that the Arabs of Palestine organized into a joint effort, mostly as Palestinians. This rebellion had some few important implications. First, it forced the Jews to step up their military capabilities. They received combat experience and were seen as more civilized, while the Arabs were mostly the ones to rise up and attack. 
Second, the eventual British crackdown of the rebellion's leadership made the Arabs even more uncentralized and disorganized, which they already were, because the Arab society was quite tribal, meaning one is loyal first to his extended family, making it hard to push for any complete national effort. Third, the British had to reevaluate the whole situation in the Middle East, and they came up with a new plan. They decided in favor of trying to pacify the Arabs by appeasing them. They tried to slow down the Jewish land purchases and the Jewish immigration. The Jews were obviously upset by that, knowing that the Jews in Central Europe were becoming more and more persecuted by Nazi Germany, and mostly blocked from fleeing into Palestine. The British figured that since the Jews would have no choice but to side with them in the coming conflict against Nazi Germany, they might as well offend the Jews and prefer the Arabs. I mean, what were the Jews going to do? Join Germany? But the Arabs were still upset, because they wanted a complete halt to Jewish immigration, which they viewed as illegitimate to begin with. So now it's really time for World War II to begin. And when it did begin, the Jews were obviously on the British side. They were trying to take in immigrants, even illegally, while also throwing their lot behind the British, and even participating in the battles that took place in Africa. The Arabs, on the other hand, were not so sure who they should favor. The Germans were obviously anti-Jewish, so they made a sensible ally. The Palestinian leadership leaned heavily in the German direction, with an important leader having close connections to Hitler himself, and even spending the war in Berlin. That served to make the Jews be perceived as even more in line with the West, as opposed to the Arabs who were not as reliable. I guess it wasn't a surprise that when Churchill came to power in Britain, he saw the attempt to appease the Arabs as displaying weakness. Churchill was a Zionist, and pivoted Britain back into backing the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. The Arabs were, of course, once again not pleased with this. Remember how I said Zionism wasn't such a popular movement by most European Jews? Well, the majority of these Jews were exterminated in the Holocaust perpetrated by the Germans, and the ones who survive will probably probably not want to go back to the countries that slaughtered their entire family and community. By the time the Allies were close to winning the war, when Roosevelt and Stalin met in Yalta, the American president professed to be a Zionist, and asked Stalin if he was one as well. Stalin said that he was, but that the Jews are natural traders that would find it hard to settle in a permanent location. I guess holding racist opinions was more common back then? Oh well, of course it was, Germany was not yet defeated, but eventually it was. Don't worry, it will soon be time for a new war. Truman, the new president of the United States, was also a Zionist. So when the winners of the Second World War convened, they just had to ask this question. What do we do with the refugees? Oh, that's easy, you just put them back in the countries where they belong. But what about the Jewish refugees? Well, the solution that the victors came up with was this. You put them in Palestine. But hold up because the British still didn't want too much trouble with the Arabs, so they couldn't just accept all Jews. The immigration had to be limited. Also, the relationship between the British and the Jews wasn't so great, as the Jews were in the middle of an insurgency that they believed would force the British to fall. The Jewish military organizations were actually not all in agreement about how to treat the British, some were more aggressive than the others, and the groups were sometimes even hostile towards one another. I guess it didn't help when the British caught illegal immigrating Jews and locked them up in Cyprus, meaning that some literally went from the Nazi death camps into British prison. But anyway, let's get a short brief on what all sides want now. The Americans and the Soviets… Well, they want to dominate the world, but that's the Cold War starting and not relevant to Palestine. At least, not for now. The British want the Jews and the Arabs to stop giving them such a headache. Palestine was turning out to be more of a nuisance than it was worth. The Arabs wanted independence. Some wanted Palestine to be part of a greater Jordan. Some wanted it to be part of a greater Syria. Mostly, the Arab society was very rural and still didn't have a concept of modern nation-state, but they did want to keep living in their homeland and to have it remain Arab. 
they wanted to completely end Jewish immigration and nip the Jewish settlements while they were still young. They would have probably also been fine with a majority world state since they were, well, the majority. But what did the Jews want? The Jews also wanted the land of Israel, but they were willing to settle for partition. Meaning that you take some land, you give it to the Jews, and you take some land and give it to the Arabs. To each his own. For the Arabs, partition and compromise was out of the question. But let's get back to the British. They decided that enough is enough. And remember the League of Nations which was made to prevent war? Well, it failed. So now its successor, called the United Nations, or the UN for short, was born. The British decided that they have had enough of the Palestine issue and that the UN should resolve it. Alright, so the UN did attempt to resolve it. They voted on a partition plan that will split the land into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Zionists were glued to the radio. It was a dramatic day for them. And the results were in. Ten countries abstained, including Britain, which apparently wanted nothing more to do with that awful place. Thirteen countries voted nay. And 33 countries voted yes. And when they heard the announcement that the resolution passed, the Jews erupted in joy. But just a short distance away from them, the Arabs were completely dismayed by the news. They felt cheated. The Jews, who should not have been there to begin with, and who had been under 40% of the population in Palestine, got 55% of the land. And why was it that the Arabs had to pay for the Holocaust? The Arabs made it clear that partition would lead to war. And indeed, it is time for our next war. In the right corner, the Arabs of Palestine. They have a numerical advantage and supportive Arab states neighboring them. In the left left corner, Jews, many of them coming directly from the Holocaust in Europe. They have less support, less people, but are way better organized and their settlements are more developed. Who will win? The Arabs started off with attacks on Jewish towns. They raided the roads, effectively laying siege to many Jewish settlements. The Jews were not doing so well. And what about the British at this time? Well, they were just kind of sitting there hoping to get out of Palestine as soon as they could. They were betting on Arab victory and they knew that if the Jews or the Arabs tried anything large scale, then they would have to intervene. They were supposed to be the guardians of that place after all. This is why both Jews and Arabs kept the conflict confined to small skirmishes. This was essentially a civil war in Palestine. This type of warfare favored the Arabs. But once the British got closer and closer to leaving and eventually left entirely, the Jews were finally free to use their main advantage, organization. The Arabs were more numerous, sure but they lacked a coherent leadership and structure. They were working as villages in a tribal manner and could not coordinate between themselves. Many of them were actually rivals. They could not concentrate their forces, but the Jews could. And they did. And this led to the Jews, who realized that they couldn't do much when on the defense, to start attacking with their military organizations. These organizations were becoming more and more like a professional army. The Jewish motivation to fight was also higher. For the Arabs, it was a war about their land. For the Jews, it was a war for existence. The way they saw it, it was win or back to the concentration camps. But the Jews also knew that the Arabs in the neighboring countries were also offended by their recent success and potential state. An attack by most of the Arab world seemed imminent. The Jews knew that they had to secure as much territory as they could to prepare for the next war. And so they went on the offensive. Hostile Arab villages quickly crumbled and fled. The Jews were shocked by how fast the Palestinian Arab resistance disintegrated. And within a very very short time, masses of Palestinian Arabs fled and entire villages remained empty or destroyed. Several occasions of Jewish cruelty towards the Arabs caused even more fear and even more fleeing. By the end of the civil war, the Palestinian Arabs were completely crushed. But you know, this just means that it's soon time for a new war. The Jews have finally declared their independence, officially establishing the state of Israel as the Palestinians around them fled into neighboring Arab states. At least fleeing into neighboring Arab states was seen as an option for them. It was not for the Jews. So it was time for a new stage of the war. 
And war indeed came. This time it was not a civil war, but a war between the newly born state of Israel and the combined Arab forces of Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon and Jordan, who invaded Israel the day after the declaration. The Arab states were much larger, much more populated, and unlike Israel, they also had heavy weapons like airplanes, artillery and tanks. The Israeli high command estimated the odds of winning at about 50%, so not great. The Jordan army was the most dangerous. It was called the Arab Legion and it was the best equipped, best trained and most fearsome Arab fighting force in the Arab world. But in general, the Arabs were very confident. They saw the war as a field trip. They expected going into the newly established state of Israel and easily conquering it. They were so confident, in fact, that they never bothered to plan any major operations together. Instead, each country looked for opportunities to simply grab as much land as it could. And what about the Palestinian Arabs? Well, they were just useful tools in justifying all this. So the two sides fought it out, but the Jews turned out to be stronger than anticipated and the Arabs turned out to be weaker than anticipated. The Arabs were barely able to make any significant progress except for the formidable Arab Legion who managed to occupy the entirety of the West Bank. But a twist. It turns out that the Jordanians knew that Israel was not as weak as the others believed and they had a secret arrangement with the Israelis in which the Israelis would allow the Jordanians to occupy the West Bank only in return they would avoid clashing with one another in other areas. So while the fighting on the Eastern Front was indeed fierce especially in Jerusalem it was not as bad as it could have been. At this point a UN ceasefire came into effect. Both sides sides used that break to regroup, but it was the Jews who had used it in a better way. The Jewish fighting forces have merged to form the IDF. Many more immigrants came and by this point the Jewish population was so mobilized that they actually outnumbered the Arab armies on the battlefield. When hostilities resumed, the Arabs found themselves facing a whole different and more powerful army. At some point, the IDF had actually pushed the Egyptians so far that the international border order into Egypt had been crossed. Britain, fearful of damage being done to their precious Suez Canal, threatened intervention and the Jews were forced to withdraw and agreed to end the war. What just happened here? Well, let's look at our two original heroes. The Palestinian Arabs had lost the entirety of Palestine. Most of it was taken over by the new Jewish state. Some of it was taken over by the Arab states, who were not too keen about giving the Palestinians independence. The Gaza Strip was taken over by Egypt and the West Bank was taken over by Jordan. Okay, it was actually called Transjordan at the time, but whatever. Some Palestinians remained inside of Israel and they are the ancestors of what is now called Israel. Israeli Arabs. All in all, almost a million Arabs became refugees. What about the Jews? Well, they have finally, against freakish odds, fulfilled the Zionist dream. In the next years, almost a million Jews who lived in the Arab world left their homes and properties behind and also became refugees, who were taken in by Israel. Who rightfully owns Palestine? The Jews have indeed returned to their ancient homeland and to the one place where they feel like they could defend themselves. The Palestinians, on the other hand, were indeed expelled from their homes and blocked from returning. Who owns the land? Does this question even mean anything? Well, I leave the rest of the thinking to you.